front of these kids and to speak here. I don't know if you've ever tried to do that. That's a little more nerve-wracking at times, trying to do that. Uh, I did ask for my name to be on the sign. I did ask that of Freddie. But the only reason, and, and I had a big introduction uh, for this, but the, the only reason was so that nobody showed up tonight expecting B.J. Clark <laughs> uh, I, and got this instead. So I, I was a little nervous that somebody would show up and say, wait a minute, that guy's not B.J. Clark. So I really actually asked Freddie to put my name on the sign. I was going to take a picture of it and then take it down. Uh, so I could use it in my PowerPoint. But I just want to make sure nobody showed up and got the wrong speaker there. So, But I'm thankful that the elders asked me if I would fill in for him tonight, and we look forward certainly to the rest of the week. Let me uh, take just a moment and say happy Father's Day as well to all you fathers out there. Hope you've had a good day. It's certainly a good day uh, to be with our families, but certainly with our spiritual family uh, as we think about that as well. In... November of 2006, in the faraway land of Nanjing, China, a city bus was going about its business and dropping people off and moving people around the city. And it pulled over at a stop and a 65-year-old grandmother got off the bus and fell and was injured. It was determined later that she actually broke her femur, which sounds really painful, although I've never been through that. But there was a person who assisted her it was the person right behind her on the bus, actually, who was a 26-year-old student by the name of Ping Yu. Mr. Ping made sure she was all right, helped her to a hospital, and even gave her something around the equivalent of 25 U.S. dollars to help her with any medical expenses that might come about because of her fall and her injury. And this old lady, 65-year-old grandmother, repaid him by suing him. Uh, she claimed he might have been at fault, and in the end, the courts actually found in her favor, and Mr. Ping was forced to pay some $7,000 to help with her medical expenses and other damages that were incurred. You fast forward about five years later to October 2011, specifically October 13th, 2011, and a little two-year-old girl by the name of Wang Yu was in, her family was in a, still in China, but in a Foshan street market, and she wandered away from her parents. Actually wandered into the road there, into the street, and was struck tragically by a white van that was passing by. The van actually stopped for just a moment and then continued on running over her again. And when it was determined later that there was actually a second white van that passed by and ran over her, her legs, I guess, would be a third time. This was captured on closed circuit television there. Uh, and in the end, it was determined that 18 people 18 people passed by this little girl laying in the road without stopping or offering any assistance to her. Now, I guess it was the 19th person. There was a, an older lady, a recycler there in the street market who was collecting things to sell, who finally stopped and helped get her to the side of the road and got some assistance, and she was taken to the hospital where she stayed for eight days until she died eight days later on October 21st, 2011 and succumbed to her injuries at that time. Now, as you can imagine, there was a lot of outrage, a lot of people really upset. Uh, I'm sad to say that uh, in doing the research, you can find this video still on the internet as you can find just about anything on the internet and it's tough to watch. Uh, 18 people passing by without even so much as lifting a finger to help this little girl who ended up dying. And there was a lot of outrage in China at that time. Uh, and the thing was, the people who were interviewed and subsequent interviews that took place of people who might have been in that area or even eyewitnesses to the count, several of them said, and referenced that because of what happened to Mr. Ping five years earlier in the $7,000 that he was forced to pay, pay, that they might have been, might have been inclined not to help for fear of what would happen to them, any retribution. Now, of course, the outrage finally won out in the end, and a couple of years later, in 2013, the area of Shenzhen, China, in the Guangdong province, actually enacted a law that would help cover people who might be in that same situation. Someone who might be wanting to offer aid to someone who was hurt but was afraid of being sued or having to pay money because they would stop and help somebody. And those laws are really actually like an international law. Now they vary from country to country. And in fact, 
They vary from state to state even here in these United States of America. But they do share one thing in common, and that is the name that they go by. You might know them as the Good Samaritan Laws. We have them from state to state here. I'm pretty sure in all 50 states and even in basically in every you know, first world or so, many of the major countries and different cities even in Europe and Asia and all over the world, they now have what is called Good Samaritan Laws. You know, when we think about the life of Jesus, uh, the names that he wore, he was called, of course, the Son of God, the Son of Man, uh, the Good Shepherd, and all those things. I don't think Master Storyteller uh, is exactly biblical. We usually call him, of course, the ma Master Teacher. But that's exactly what he was, a Master Storyteller. Neil Lightfoot, in his book, The Parables of Jesus, Part 1, actually suggests that it was one-third, over one-third, of the teachings of Jesus that's recorded for us was done in these parable forms. So it was of importance. We know the word parable, the Greek word or the Greek words that make up this idea of parable is to throw alongside possibly the idea that this is a story thrown alongside a truth to help illustrate that truth. I think even though we might not, the Bible may not use the word storyteller, Jesus certainly was a, a master storyteller in crafting these different parables. Now, God willing, through each night, the rest of the week, uh, we're going to look at these diff some different parables. You may have seen the slide we showed the kids earlier, but the different friendship parables of Jesus. I know Brother Clark will do a fine job. But tonight, we're going to talk about the Good Samaritan. You know, I find it fascinating sometimes. If we were to go down the street and ask people what they know about the Bible, right? It's, it's possible that John 3, 16, you know, that's what everybody kind of knows if you ask somebody what they know about the Bible. Uh, it's amazing, frankly amazing to me, how many people know, judge not that you be not judged today, right? I don't know how many of them can find that it's in Matthew 7, uh, chapter 7 in verse 1, but everybody knows you can even get started. Judge not, they could say that you be not judged. But if we were to ask them to go through the parables, it's possible that the parable that is known the most is the one in Luke 15, actually, that is called the lost son. Most of the world, of course, knows him as the prodigal son. That might be first on the list, but maybe second on the list of parables that people know and even do in part to the laws that we were just talking about is the parable of the Good Samaritan. If you've got your Bible, you can turn over to Luke chapter 10. That's where it's found. We're not going to go many other places tonight. There's just really not much of a need to. We'll look at a few other supplemental verses along the way. But in Luke chapter 10, we come across this occasion. And we want to break it down in the few minutes that we have together tonight. What I'd like to do for you and do for us together as we think about this is try to break down the scene that takes place, that scene being what's taking place here in Luke chapter 10, and then go into the story and then think a little bit about the significance. When we think about the Good Samaritan, it's, it's true. Even if people don't know anything but the Good Samaritan laws, there are lots of people that understand the concept because in general, it's not so much about being baptized. It's not you know, so much about the way we worship and some of those things that causes controversy and discussion, but it's something that a lot of people know even if they can't recall the entire story. Let's talk, first of all, about the scene for just a few moments. If you've got your Bibles there, let's talk about the time, first of all. If you're there in Luke 10, actually go back to Luke chapter 9 in verse 51. When we talk about the time of what is occurring here, Luke records for us, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, capital H, him, Jesus, to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus is preparing himself for his death. I guess in essence he was doing that all along, but Luke even records for us here, chapter 9 and verse 51, that he was setting his face, as the New King James says here, uh, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So he's headed that way. In chapter 10, there are 70 that are sent out two by two. And by the time chapter 10 is over, in verse 17, we actually read about them coming back. And then we jump to verse 23, and Jesus has a private moment, if you will. A private moment with his disciples where he's talking to them, and then we come to verse 25. In verse 25, we meet the lawyer. That's the next person on our list here. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up. Now, this lawyer would not be the lawyer like we would think of, someone who practices civil law. 
I like it better that way because of this, this conversation that's fixing to take place between him and Jesus, but that's not what he was. We would think of him more as a scribe. We would use the term scribe, someone who would copy, if you will, the law, someone who should have been an expert in the law. Now, when we say that, of course, again, we're not meaning civil law disputes where somebody might sue someone else. We're talking about the law, God's law at the time for his children. But he should have been an expert in the law. So we meet the lawyer, and then next we come across the test. Because in verse 25 there, it tells us as well that when he stood up, he tested him. Now, I may say it a few times, but I, I have the New King James in front of me. I, I believe it may be the King James or a few others that says that he made trial of him. Again, I, that's why I kind of like this idea of this being a lawyer like you might see on TV, but that's not exactly what he was. Now, in and of itself, this idea of making trial of Jesus sounds really bad to us. I don't know if when you look at the words, if that is really malicious in and of itself. Now, we're going to talk about the real reason in just a moment, and we kind of get a clue into what this lawyer was thinking. But either way, it's recorded for us that he tested him in seeking what he might say and trying to talk to Jesus here. Uh, I would submit to you that, and again, in a lawyer type of fashion, that after he asked this test, and the test is, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I, I find it amazing. We kind of want to hit at the lawyer and, and take him down for testing Jesus, but his question is the one that we should all be asking. It's the question that, that everybody should ask. We kind of rephrase it today in our society, in our world, and we say, what must I do to be saved? As we sang just a few moments ago. But it's the same question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, again, we're going to get to the motive. But at least on the surface, the question is exactly what he should be asking Jesus. But after he asked this and test him, Jesus, again, kind of takes, I would call it a lawyer type of term. I also like to call it a mother type of term. When your kids keep asking you a million questions, what do you do? You don't give them the answer. You ask them another question in return. That's what moms like to do sometimes. So Jesus doesn't give them the answer and say, okay, that's enough. We're done. Jesus instead sort of redirects him. And what does he say there in verse 26? What is written in the law and what is your reading of it? Now that old, old timeless mother trick. And I'm just going to ask you more questions while you keep hounding me with questions. A, a couple of points of interest. You know, he asked him what is written. We know that God all throughout time has had uh, uh, precedence upon what is written. Today we go by what is written. Jesus asked, what is written in the law and how do you read it? Uh, again, motherly kind of trick. You, what do you think about it? I'm not, not going to tell you what the answer is. What do you think about it? So Jesus, in a way, sort of redirects him here from that. And then we get the reply in verse 27. So the lawyer answers him and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, Again, what a great answer. Quoting from Deuteronomy and Leviticus, what is told there that we should do. Uh, and, and he emphasizes not only the vertical relationship, if you will, that relationship between God and man, but that horizontal relationship. Love the Lord your God and then love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to look at another passage where this is discussed as well in just a moment. But Jesus says, this is everything. The law and the prophets hang on this. I think we talked about this in our class the other night with Freddie downstairs. If we all loved God like we should, and we all loved our neighbor as we should, we'd solve a lot of problems in this world. And that's sort of what this is getting at here. So the reply from the lawyer, not that bad in general. But then we come to the real reason. Because again, testing him or making trial of him in and of itself may not be that much. But the lawyer gives himself up in verse 29, or at least as Luke records for us, but he wanting to justify himself. You know, I, I don't, we obviously don't have time to get into it tonight, but I think this is, the, this is what gets most people in the world. We are so good at justifying ourselves for what we want to do. Sometimes we see people or hear about people engaged in sin, and, and Hannah looks at me and says, you know, why would a person do that? How could they do that? Well, in order to do what you want to do, we'll do just about anything to justify ourselves. And that's what this lawyer says here. Luke, by inspiration, clues us in. And we kind of, then that's when we really kind of start hitting at the lawyer a little bit and say, you know, he's trying to test Jesus because he's wanting to justify himself. Now, an interesting note here as we come to uh, verse 28, back up just a moment to when Jesus answers this lawyer. 
He said to him, you have answered rightly. As we said a moment ago, Jesus says, correct. Do this and you will live. Now, an interesting point because we're going to talk about it in just a few moments. Hang on and we'll come back to it. The lawyer says, when he says back in verse 25, teacher, what shall I do? The do there, the Greek word, the Greek form of the word is in the eros tense, which is kind of lends itself to the idea of what's the one thing I must do? He's hoping Jesus is going to tell him to go over there and dig a 10-foot hole and you can inherit eternal life. What's the one thing I have to do? The one time, one thing do to be saved or to inherit eternal life. And when Jesus answers him here in verse 28, he says, do this. Jesus, is the, ver the verb there for the word do is keep on doing it continually. Jesus says, no, 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 it's not about the one thing. You don't just get to go dig a hole or, of course, in the end it's going to be, you don't just be baptized. You keep on doing these things. You keep on living this life. And so when the real reason comes about in verse 29 and the lawyer wants to justify himself, he says, well, who is my neighbor? So again, I think of Jesus sort of in that motherly fashion, you know, redirecting him with another question, but just like those kids do, they come back at you again. Okay, well, who's my neighbor then? Keep telling. It's like a battle of the questions here. Okay, so who's my neighbor? And it's with that in mind that then we hit the story. The story that you know, but let's remind ourselves very quickly for just a moment, beginning in verse 30. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Verse 33, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So you, you know this. Again, most of the world knows this. But for just a moment, let's look at it. First of all, we meet the man. Now, most versions probably say a certain man. A lot of people believe this would be a Hebrew or a Jew that was passing down the road, and that lends itself more towards this idea of the relationship with the Samaritan that we'll get into in just, in just a moment. But this certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, some of you, it's possible, might have been in this area of the world before, but it is quite a treacherous trip. I, I found this interesting information. It says the scene of the story is set along that rugged and dangerous road that connected Jerusalem and Jericho. The distance is some 17 miles and the descent from the Mount of Olives to the priestly community of Jericho was nearly 4,000 feet. So we're talking about actually it was going from above 2,000, 3,000 feet above sea level down to 1,000 feet below sea level when you reach Jericho. And under ideal conditions, it's estimated that it would have taken up to six hours to traverse the distance between the cities. I, I, I imagine, we're not talking about a road that is as wide as the auditorium here. Uh, I imagine pictures that I've seen, not as road as wide as that four lane we traveled to Chattanooga and back today. I, I picture something and some pictures, you know, possibly even as wide as the pews maybe here. I mean, it's a very rocky, very narrow road. In fact, J.W. McGarvey in 1879 had the chance to travel that area with some friends on horseback, and he noted that the trail, that in the trail there were several areas where robbers might hide, assault unwary victims, and make, ready, make a ready escape. So this is and was called by many people the bloody way because of the fact that so many people were, you know, were ter uh, terrorized here by bandits and thieves who would take their stuff. So again, the master storyteller knows exactly what he's doing. When he's telling this account, these people know exactly what, they're, what he's talking about. You know, it's like we talk about going over 111. They understand what it is, and he know, they know exactly what that road would be like and how rugged it would be. And so this man is making that trip when he is met by, I use the word on here, bandits, but thieves, robbers, whatever it, it might be that you want to look at there. And they're going to, of course, just beat him up. 
Uh, I don't know if it was as bad as how he got it last night there in that picture uh, that we showed earlier, but, uh, you know, they, they took it to him pretty good and took all his stuff, and there he is, which makes it all the more interesting for me when we meet the priest. And, and I talk about the, the width of the road. I don't know, but, but I like to think in my mind, we're not talking about this certain man lying on one side of 111 and this priest walking by all the way on the other side. I imagine that you're talking about something a little more narrow. I mean, almost having to step over the guy to get past him. Now, it says pass by on the other side. There was some room there, but I don't think, you know, we're talking about as wide as the interstate there when we're going down. But nevertheless, this priest, a priest, you know, a, a Levite there who's set to do these things for God to take care of all these priestly duties, this priest is willing to pass by. Kind of reminds me of a passage in Matthew chapter 25. You remember that passage where Jesus talks about the things that people did do or might not do to people that they come in contact with? This priest sees this certain man and passes by on the other side, which is when we meet the Levite. Now, Levites, of course, you know, all the priests came from the tribe of Levi. They were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. So the Levites were there to assist the priests. Boy, this Levite gets a star, doesn't he? He assisted them A-OK. -okay. He passed by on the other side, too. He says, I'll assist this priest. Of course, they probably weren't together, but I'll do the exact same thing. I'll assist him by going and doing exactly what he did and staying as far away as we can from this man, which is when we meet the Samaritan. Now, I find it interesting, of course, he's not exactly the good Samaritan, is he, when we meet him? I mean, we don't know anything about him, but he is a certain Samaritan. He's a mongrel, if you will, or a half-breed. We could spend the rest of the night talking about how much these people were despised. In fact, there was a, a, a saying by the rabbis, and of course we read and look through church history, there was a, a saying by the rabbis that said, may I never set eyes on a Samaritan. Now, that's what they were treated like. We think about John 8 and verse 48. The Jews there accused Jesus of being a Samaritan. Now, does that sound like a pat on the back? Uh, I don't think so. I think that sounds like when Freddie says that somebody's from Bledsoe County. All right, well, I don't know that he's always being so kind when he says that sometimes. Now, he's saying it as a joke, but that's exactly what we're getting at here. When they call Jesus a Samaritan, they're not trying to pat him on the back for what he's done. They're trying to take a shot at him. And so this Samaritan is somebody we also might say you wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. And there he sees this man, again, possibly or more than likely a Hebrew passing by who would spit on him if he had the opportunity to, and yet he's moved with compassion and he's going to help. And of course, in the end, we meet the innkeeper. Not a lot said about the innkeeper, but I found a few interesting questions to just kind of stir our thoughts for just a moment. An interesting thought about the innkeeper, how did the Samaritan know that he could trust this innkeeper with the funds that he left him? Did the two men know one another from past associations? Simply conjecture, but it's something to think about. What about this? What if the innkeeper was, saw the compassion of the Samaritan and was moved with the same compassion to take care of this man? And just be thought, maybe thoughts that we have along the way, but certainly something to think about as we think about what takes place here in this story. Let's talk for a few moments here about the significance. Let's try to drive it home. But before we kind of get into some examples for me and for you, let's finish out the story. I stopped just a little bit short. What happens in verse 36? Now, I like to call it the, the knockout. I don't know if you're boxing fans. I'm not really. But I, I think about what Jesus might have been doing if this was physical. We stopped at verse 35, but as Jesus ends the story, in verse 36, he says, So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves. Now again, if, if, it's, if it's physical, if we could see Jesus, I almost picture that, that wind up like you might see on a cartoon or a video game. He's ready to deliver that haymaker, that knockout punch, and put this lawyer in his place, so to speak. Now, of course, in the way that only the Son of God could, in a kind fashion, with a question that you already knew the answer to, right? That's the interesting thing about the parables of Jesus. When he's telling them, the answer's laid out there. He could have said very simply, he could have stopped right there at the end of verse 35 and said, when I come again, I will repay you, and walked off. But he goes ahead and asks that question that he knows, the lawyer already knows the answer to. So, as my father-in-law would so kindly say, so big boy, tell me what the answer is to my question now. Who is the one that is his neighbor? And so then we get the answer from the lawyer. Now, I found in reading and, and studying for this lesson an interesting thought that I'd never thought about before. This scribe, this lawyer, being a Hebrew, being a Jew and one of the law, 
he wouldn't like the Samaritan, which of course is the whole point of the parable, but he wouldn't like that. Not only would he not like that man or the idea of that man being compassionate, but he wouldn't even want to utter his name. Picture, if you will, for just a moment, Jesus asked this question, and he knows the lawyer knows the answer, but yet the lawyer can't bring himself to say the Samaritan, right? Because that's the right answer. The answer is who is the neighbor, who was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? The answer from the story is the Samaritan. But that lawyer says, I can't say Samaritan. He says the one who had mercy on him. The one who showed mercy on him in verse 37. Can't even spit out the word or the name, the idea of a Samaritan. Instead just leaves it in that general way of he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus leaves him with the charge. Go and do likewise. Now I wasn't great in English when I was in school. I, I think most English teachers would tell you this is, there's an imaginary word there at the start of that uh, statement by Jesus, you. It's a personal charge, you, and then the verbs, go and do, go and do, are the same things that Jesus used at the beginning when he told him that he needed to do that. It's continue going and continue doing. Don't just, not, this is done, don't go find somebody over there on the side of the road and give them $5 and go on your way and think that you got it figured out. You need to keep going, you need to keep doing. It's that type of verb tense that is used here by Jesus. Now, we end there, of course, as far as this account goes, but we've got to make application to our life for just a few moments when we think about it. Anything that you read about, uh, any kind of commentary or, or any other lesson just about that you read about the Good Samaritan, there's a lot of discussion of the three philosophies of life. In fact, B.C. Goodpasture, uh, who was the editor of the Gospel Advocate for many years, uh, published a volume of works by T.B. Larimore, uh, sermons and, and things by T.B. Larimore. T.B. Larimore was one of the most eloquent preachers that of the what we might call second generation of American Restoration preachers and B.C. Goodpasture published these things and one of the, the sermons that was in that volume, in that book was the three philosophies of life from the parable of the Good Samaritan. So let's talk about them for just a moment. The first one of course is the iron rule. The iron rule is the one that says that might makes right. Might makes right. And of course when we make the application to our lesson tonight this was the practice of the robbers. Uh, you know, what's mine is mine, and what's yours is yours until I can overpower you and take it from you, and then it's mine. Might makes right. We understand that. And that's sort of the iron rule that the robbers put forth here. Take from others whatever you please or whatever you can. You might have known somebody like that. A lot of time it starts on the schoolyard, right on the playground, the bully of the class, and, and I'll take whatever I want that's yours. The second rule is the silver rule. The silver rule is essentially this. Do no harm to others, but look out primarily for your own interest. Just, you know, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to take what's yours, uh, but I, if you're in need, if you're in help, I'm not going to bother myself with what you need in the end. And of course, it's very obvious that from the parable of the Good Samaritan, that would be the priest and the Levite. Uh, I'm not going to walk over and kick him while he's down and add one more kick to his gut there, but I'm going to pass by on the other side because I've got somewhere to be. I've got something else to do. I, I don't have time for this right now. So that would be the silver rule. And then, of course, the golden rule. And we know and understand that do unto others what you would have done unto you. We try to teach that on the schoolyard, right, and on the playground. And sometimes the bully, the iron rule, wins out. We start trying to teach our kids the golden rule. And, of course, the golden rule is the Samaritan here, the person who would rather spit on him and kick him while he's down, but instead chooses to be moved with compassion and help take care of him in this instance. It's obvious which one we should live by. It's obvious the golden rule that we should practice. The question is, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? A couple of other passages if you want to turn there and follow along for just a moment. The first one is Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. We just quoted it a moment ago. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The golden rule. That's the way that we should be treating people. And you know, this is probably why this parable may be number two on the list and maybe even number one on some people's list. It's got real world application. We don't have to argue about the other things which are important. Don't get me wrong. We need to discuss baptism and, and worship and other things with people. But we can all understand whether you're in China or whether you're in the United States or Dunlap or Bledsoe or wherever you are, 
that we need to treat others the way that we want to be treated. When we think about what is said there, I think about Matthew 22 and verses 34 through 40. It's here that we meet a group of Pharisees who actually come upon Jesus because they, they might be a little excited. We read in verse 34 that when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, hey, he told them other guys what's up, let's go take our shot at him, that they gathered together. And what happens in verse 35? One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Don't change the channel, this is the same repeat, okay? The same thing, but in another instance here, of them asking him what's going on. And they ask about what the greatest command is. And you see some of the same phrases that we looked at just a few moments ago in Luke chapter 10. And I like the, the same thing here, the first and greatest and the second command. And in verse 40, when Jesus says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I don't want to risk it sounding like a broken record, but we said it a few moments ago. If we would just take care of that vertical relationship with God and that horizontal relationship with each other, we'd solve a lot of problems in the world today. And of course, we think a lot of times about Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Paul says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Are these the verses that we are living by or are we choosing to live by the iron rule? Or maybe we're more guilty of the silver rule. We're not going around taking everybody's stuff, but we're choosing just to take care of ourselves and ourself alone. Freddie, is he ringing at 20 after 25? Did he say? He had said 20, but I thought I heard you say 25. Did you give me five minutes? <laughs> it's 20. All right, so very quickly, this is the question. Who is my neighbor? And I want to ask you, is it these people? It, are these people your neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Is, is it these people or this person? You might recognize those signs. This is a person from the, the Westboro Baptist Church. Somebody who, the, these group of people who are really discussing the things they do, protesting funerals and all, trying to maybe get a good message across, but in quite a terrible and hateful way. Who's my neighbor? Is it these people? Because you see them all over your news as well. That's the question that we're trying to get. Who is my neighbor? Do you recognize anybody in those pictures that might be your neighbor? Because that's what we're trying to understand with this parable of the Good Samaritan. You see, I think this is the 21st century question. I think this is our question. Those things that were on those pictures, that's been on your TV. It's been on your Facebook news feed. It's been all over the place. It's all around us in the world today. Who is my neighbor? This is our question. You know, an interesting thing that was pointed out in the material that we were given was this. The Samaritan in this story had demonstrated the qualities of a true neighbor, and that is this. A true neighbor is this. Showing compassion on one who in another setting might have demonstrated rudeness and hatred toward him. If that Hebrew or that certain man hadn't been lying on the ground, they might have come to fisticuffs. There might have been spitting. There might have been fighting on that road from Jerusalem to Jamerica, or Jericho as these two ran into each other. But that's not what happened because one of them was laying half dead on the ground. The Samaritan was a true neighbor because he showed compassion when in another setting it would have been hatred, it would have been rudeness. And again, from what we kind of read, no, it wouldn't have been the Samaritan. It would have been that Hebrew or that Jew that would have been looking at him crosswise and yelling at him and insulting him along the way. When we come back to the story that we started off with just a few moments ago in China, the court that found in favor of the 65-year-old grandmother and forced Mr. Peng to pay the $7,000, when they found in favor of her and they laid out their ruling, this is what they said. They found in favor of the grandmother because no one would in good conscience help someone unless they felt guilty. Nobody, despite the lack of evidence, not, no, no camera, no nothing, no eyewitnesses, despite not being able to prove that he pushed her down, nobody would help somebody like that unless they felt guilty. So he must be guilty. Now, that's 2006. We go back all the way to Luke chapter 10. Jesus is trying to teach us that that's not the way we should be about things. Who is my neighbor? It's the people carrying the rainbow flags. Who's my neighbor? It's even the protesters. Who's my neighbor? It's all of you in this room. And when we think about what the Good Samaritan did, then we need to be practicing that in our life. Showing compassion and helping along the way. That's the significance of this. Again, without getting into all the things that we sometimes argue about when it comes to Christianity and things that are the truth. 
Don't get me wrong, we have to talk about those things. Sometimes we get so hung up we forget about practicing the, the, the parable that we should all know and be able to put into practice. Who is my neighbor? Well, the one who showed mercy on him, the one who needs it, the person that we can help along the way, treating others the way that we want to be treated. I think we're out of time, but we'll come back and finish up in just a moment. Thank you for your attention.